Kelly Brooks Fletcher here alongside Joshua Perry. And we got Danny Kay back in studio. She's one of the hosts on the Tennis Channel and host of Live on the Line right here on Stadium. Mm -hmm. Danny Kay, great to see you. Great to see you guys. And look, I walked into the office today <laughs> and they were both in pink. And uh, pink's my favorite Not color. Not on purpose, by the way. So I found a shirt somewhere upstairs. <laughs> Thanks, wardrobe. And um, yeah. We all have to have a matching moment. I know. We were like, what sort of excuse are we going to say Like, once we come on air? I don't like, have it's one. not Wednesday, so we don't wear pink. Um, <laughs> it's Thursday. Yeah. We're Valentine's Day for Margot coming up Robbie for the Oscar stuff. I think, like, that, I that's think that's, that's good. Go yeah. yeah. Sure. I know. We all we do this a lot. Far too often. We're back on our like little, uh, we're back on the same You're page. That's sync. good. We're in sync. Look at us. Oh, no. Well, I'm glad you guys let me join the party. The pink right. party. We appreciate <laughs> you joining. All right, we got a lot to get to, so let's get right to it in today's Big Trends. And the NFL coaching carousel, it just continues to move. Today, the Falcons, they landed on a new head coach, hiring Raheem Morris, who was most recently the defensive coordinator for the Rams. Now, Morris is a former Falcons assistant and was their interim head coach in 2020. So what does he bring to the table, JP? Uh, I think he brings a lot of energy. It's the one thing that people who have been around him talk about. And I think he has a unique perspective as a coach because you mentioned his time in Atlanta familiar with the organization but not necessarily familiar with what has gone down the last couple of years that led to them making a change at head coach he is a guy who has coached on both sides of the football which I find to be very intriguing his, uh, you know, cut his teeth on the defensive side of the ball, but he's worked with wide receivers. He's been involved in uh, scheming up pass game. I think that's really good for somebody who's walking in and is going to have to do some tinkering on either side of the ball. He understands defense. He understands offense. Um, ultimately, he's going to have to find a quarterback that he feels like is the guy for their future. Mm -hmm. Then number two, really find a way to integrate these dynamic weapons that we all talked about all year long for the Falcons that we didn't think were getting used properly. And if he can do that, I think he's got a wide open shot at making a little bit of a run here in the future. It's really interesting. About a week ago, I saw Les Snead put about a three-minute monologue on Twitter talking about why Raheem Moore should get some head coaching looks and what he brings to the table. And he mentioned something, joking of course, but saying there's going to be a lot of tampering charges because this guy's going to have so many players texting him wanting to play for him. And it just goes to show you that coaches right now that, uh, that are younger, mm -hmm. uh, can relate a little bit more to the players, are who organizations want to get in the building because the players are respecting them and for whatever reason the old regime is out the new regime is in and right now this is a huge opportunity for Raheem Morris but it sounds like every single compliment that he gets it's just all about what a great guy mm -hmm. coach and well-liked guy in a building he is, which I think is really cool. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up. Old regime out, sure. new regime is in, which leads to Bill Belichick because we know that he, we thought he was going to be in high demand as, uh, you know, after leaving the Patriots there, he interviewed with the Falcons twice. And so it left many wondering, well, why did it not work out? Why did the Falcons not hire him? Now, that raises the question, was it because of his old school, uh, old school style where he's, you know, more hard-nosed and now players want more of a player's coach where they feel like they can uh, relate to them? I also go back to we've talked about this here on the show how he likes to have control mm -hmm. and the GM role and CEO Rich McKay he said at the beginning of the coaching search that uh, their their GM and Fontenot he was not going to lose his role he was going to you know Arthur Blank has spoke highly of him saying that he has done a great job there mm -hmm. so you know it makes you wonder okay that Belichick, he went through two interviews, so maybe he really wanted the job, right. or maybe he didn't get deep into uh, deep enough into a conversation to where that was brought up, and then maybe he was like, you know what? This, it might not be for me. We'll never know, but it does raise some questions. I there. know a lot of these second interviews, the idea is by the end of the interview, you're talking about terms of a contract and yeah. what it would look like. You're talking about what personnel you would like to bring in. Who are you targeting for offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator? Who do you want for your special teams? Things of that nature. So I do think that there was real interest for Bill Belichick to want this job. But to the point that you both brought up, there, it feels like there's a lot of momentum when it comes to him that the way that he got it done before in becoming the best coach in NFL history is not a way that's going to work into the future. It was very much my way or the highway. It was very much I'm going to try to get cheap and develop. And right now we're not in a, a space where people are willing to put the time in to do those types of things. You don't have a Tom Brady in that building mm -hmm. to be a champion of everything that you're preaching. I think one of the things that we have to realize about the way Bill Belichick got things done is Tom Brady was over there co-signing everything. And if Tom Brady says it's good, then everybody's going to believe it's good. He's not going to have that there 
in Atlanta. So I think there's the other part about it, too. I don't know how many years you get out of Bill Belichick, which is, you know, a question when somebody is of his age. But, like, I think people are trying to get with the times in terms of how you motivate and connect with players, and an older coach doesn't always feel like the answer for that. The little teeny tiny caveat that I don't think you mentioned, and I'm surprised you didn't, is just the front office inner workings with sure. the head coach when it comes to Bill Belichick. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure there was quite a number of people up there that just didn't want him to get hired simply because they didn't know what how it would affect their job. I can right. only imagine yeah. that that played into the mix as well. A little bit less uh, of a situation where you can almost have control over a head coach, no that was not going to be the case with Bill Belichick. Yeah, and going back, yeah, the GM, you know, he, him wanting control, but maybe it wasn't a good fit. I remember us talking, though, when we found out that he was interviewing with the Falcons, at least from my standpoint, I was like, uh, I don't see him really with the Falcons. It just didn't seem like a good fit just because they didn't have the quarterback in place, and it just didn't seem like it was a team that was ready to win a Super Bowl now. I felt like a good fit for Bill Belichick would have been a team like the Cowboys if they were even in the Chargers. Or maybe yeah. even the Chargers right. where they had a quarterback that that had potential and right. that he could really work with and really do something with that team. The Falcons, in my opinion, it just never really moved the needle for me. It feels like they're they're a little bit away, and it's because of the quarterback because it doesn't feel like they have the guy on the roster, and if they can't get a veteran guy through free agency, then all of a sudden you're looking at a developmental quarterback that you're going to have to pick up. And I keep going back to the idea of I don't know how much time you have with Bill. If yeah. you hire him, it feels like you need to have the pieces in place right now so you can get competitive pretty quickly and if that requires developing a quarterback for two, three seasons, it just doesn't you don't you don't have the security of knowing if it's going to work. Well, and I think it's important to note that the Rams, they are getting something in return for this, right? Yes, compensatory pick. So uh, a part of the Rooney rule now is that. <laughs> we just hate that word. Compensatory. You know what? That was perfect because it? it was on your face. Yeah. Honestly, that was like <laughs> we couldn't <laughs> It was a good team. That was awesome. That is called an excellent host. She knows what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. So the Rams will get compensatory picks back for Raheem uh, Morris. As a part of the Rooney rule, if you develop a minority coach for at least two years in your system, if that coach is then hired to be uh, a head coach, you get something back in return. Not the same situation for Tampa. Uh, with their offensive coordinator going to be the head coach of the Panthers. He was only in the system for a year, but there you have it. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to compensatory. That, there we that go. Word is just there we go. Awful. <laughs> just All awful. right. Well, the Falcons, they have their guy. We'll see what's next for Bill Belichick uh, and what his future in the NFL looks like here. But from uh, the NFL to the NBA, we have more details out about Doc Rivers and his new deal with the Bucks. there. They've signed him to a $40 million deal through the 2026-27 season, making him one of the highest paid coaches in the league, according to our Sham Sharania. And with that, guys, the Bucks will now be paying three different coaches, <laughs> three different coaches for the time being. So, I mean, Joshua, what does this mean for the Bucks? I mean, it feels like they they have targeted somebody that they think is their guy. And I, 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 the timing of this is we want to get ahead of what the hiring cycle may look like. We want to salvage our season. All of the things that are involved there. So, they say Doc, and, and Doc probably would have been a guy later on as more coaches got fired that would have been desirable. Certainly had to entice him to leave a cushy television job. So I understand how they got there. I think Doc is a good coach. But a lot of people would ask the question, is he top three, four, five highest paid in the game good? And I don't think we've seen that. He's got the championship. Nobody's denying that. Has not been great in some of the closeout games. He is a guy who has been abrasive at times. And I think Milwaukee needs a guy like that who can walk in and command respect right away. But... $40 million seems like a nice little chunk of change there, Danny. You're being really sweet by just saying he's not great at closeout games. I'm going to actually just get into it. <laughs> Game sevens, he's 6-10 in mm -hmm. critical matchups. Okay, you want to talk about when you have a 3-1 and one series lead, only 13 instances ever in the NBA has a team lost when they have a 3-1 series lead. 13. Three of those times were Doc Rivers' mm. teams. And this is the third highest paid coach. Now, look, I get what you're doing here. Leadership, absolutely. And great acumen, 1,000%. Uh, obviously has the playoff experience. And the ultimate goal here for the Bucks is to go win a championship. And that's the reason they're investing so much into someone with so much experience. But it would definitely concern me paying that much for someone that, when it comes down to those critical games, 
hasn't seen the success. Well, and it's not like he was coaching teams that didn't have the talent to win championships Absolutely. there. You had Joel Embiid. You even had James Harden at one point. Uh, those are just a few names uh, on, on the Sixers there. But, yeah, you have a, you have a tandem and uh, Damian Lillard and Giannis. Mm -hmm. So you have the talent on this Bucks team, but is it enough to get to the championship with Doc at the head? If they play some damn defense. Yeah, that I mean, that's going to change immediately. <laughs> yeah. But I think the other part is the part that Shams Sharani brought up is that he's been in the building as right. an advisor. Yeah. And that's mind blowing. But it makes you realize that the players were obviously buying in yes. to whatever he was saying. So as long yes. as he has their ear, that's a way better situation scenario recipe to go deeper and deeper in the playoffs, ultimately try to push for that championship. Because if they if he has their respect, that's step one. And, and it's a crucial step one. Yes. And understand that Doc has to be in a mentality right now too where he's heard all the stats and he's heard people talk about the one championship and yeah. nothing else to show for it in his time off I hope he was thinking about things he would do differently when he gets into the critical moments how he would handle the locker room differently so this time around with a really good team where a lot of us are not going to make excuses if they are not great by the end of the year He's got to be ready for this moment now. That's a great point you made there because sometimes you do have to take a step back and look at things from a different lens or a different perspective. And maybe, yeah, think about, okay, maybe I should have done this differently or see how players react to certain coaches or situations. So good for Doc. Uh, but, yeah, the Bucks they got they got to get out their checkbooks. They got a lot, a lot of, of checks money. that they're writing there. All right, when we come back, <laughs> yeah, make it rain. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk some baseball because Joe Maurer, he is a Hall of Famer. But the decision has raised some questions about who else deserves to get in. Steve Phillips, he's going to stop by to sort that all out. Michigan lost Jim Harbaugh, which means it's time to go to work. Joshua, he's going to tell us what's on their to-do list. And the Panthers, they also hired a new head coach, so we're going to take a look at the task at hand for Dave Canales. That's coming up next. first spring training game. Pitchers and catchers will begin reporting on February 13th. So with that, we're going to welcome in Steve Phillips. 
who knows a thing or two about some baseball. Steve, great to see you. I hope you're recovering from the Jim Harbaugh news. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay. Listen, if Sharon Moore can t get the job, I'd love it. He won some huge games for us this year. The kids respond to him. So, listen, we wish Harbaugh luck. Go Chargers. But... Let's go. I, Sharon Moore is the man, I think. He's got to be, I, to me, it's an easy slam dunk decision for Michigan. Yeah, Good Sharon, ball, he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, easy transition for that program for sure. All right, well, before we look ahead, let's take a look at just the Hall of Fame class because that's made headlines this week. Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, and Joe Mauer, they were all going in. But listen, a lot of guys took issue with Mauer getting in on the first ballot. So do you think that's the right call, Steve? So I was surprised he got in on the first ballot as well. I am. I think he's a Hall of Famer. And so, you know, when I put together my own list, and I don't have an actual vote with the writers, but he didn't make my list only because he was 11 on my list. And then Jimmy Rollins was 12. I thought there were at least 12 Hall of Famers on the ballot. And so I think he's a Hall of Famer, but I, I'm surprised that he went on the first ballot because you, you break down his numbers. He didn't even have a thousand RBIs in his career. Now he's a 54 war player. And, you know, the war numbers are there, but, you know, he, he really, as a catcher, won three batting titles. And I think because of that, that's a special thing. Ernie, Ernie Lombardi did that way back in the day uh, for the Reds. And so this is a really special thing. But when he transitions to first base, he doesn't profile as a first baseman. I mean, he was slugging under 400 as a corner infielder, and it's not a way to build a team. And, and yet... You know, the batting average was something that I think people held on to, an over-career 300 batting average. He led the league in on-base percentage twice, was an MVP as well. I thought he would get in, but I thought that the writers would have to do a little bit of work, sort of sorting through the numbers some. I think part of it is the story. First pick overall in the draft, hometown kid, and he is a Hall of Fame person. He is as nice a guy. And so where sometimes writers might hold it against somebody that they had a bad relationship Everybody loves Joe Maurer. They love him. And I think because of that, that played into their saying three batting titles as a catcher, he's got to be a Hall of Famer. Well, you already mentioned it. He didn't have the traditional stats, but a really impressive war. But how is this going to impact other catchers looking for Hall of Fame consideration? Well, I think one of the things that really is such a disappointment to me is Jorge Posada was one and done. He was one and done on the ballot. He, he had like 3% and he was off. I think Buster Posey with the MVPs, I think he's the next guy that could benefit from what ended up happening here with Maurer. Now, you know, some of Maurer's war that he accumulated was at first base, where he really was a solid player, could have been a gold glover. Uh, but I think Buster Posey's case is really helped by this as well. In your gut, Posey feels like a Hall of Famer, but with injuries and maybe not playing deep into his 30s, you know, he hasn't accumulated some of the quantitative numbers. But I think it's going to open the door a little bit for some people to get a look at it. And I think you can make a case for some pitchers now. Felix Hernandez, who's going to be on the on the, the ballot next year, didn't have the longevity. But you look at an eight-year time span, and he was one of the best pitchers in baseball. Actually, maybe the top three pitchers in baseball for eight years. That's kind of what Posey or what Maurer was. And you wonder whether that logic will play in to shorter impact but major impact for players moving forward. All right, Steve, let's take a look at the free agent market here. We're a few weeks out from spring training. Still a lot of big names available. Are you surprised by this? I am. I, I think that it really comes down to Blake Snell and Cody Bellinger and Scott Boris. You know, these are Scott Boris clients. He, uh, clients, he slow plays the market, uh, you know, and when he doesn't hear the offers that he expects, what he'll do is wait it out and hope that somebody, one owner, gets a little itchy uh, and decides to make a deal. And then once he gets one team in, then he'll start to pull some others in and build it up from the ground up again. Uh, I'm not sure that teams are going to react that way. I think at some point they're going to have to accept the market is what it is. But, you know, he has Snell and Montgomery. There's more interest in Montgomery. But what he doesn't want to do is sign Montgomery and then have Snell get more uh, or to get less and have to sign explain to the other client. I don't know how he manages two very similar guys in the same market where teams are interested in both and how he pursues it. But I think that we will start to see some movement maybe below the top layer. We saw Reese Hoskins come off the board with Milwaukee. I think we're going to see some more action there. Let's talk about Pete Alonso for a moment here because he's heading into the final year of his deal. Do you think that he's going to get traded? So David Stearns, their new president of baseball operations, has said they're not going to trade him. He's going to be their first baseman on opening day. 
and i think they also understand now that he's represented by scott boras, he's not going to sign an extension right now. he's going to go to the open market into free agency and then see what he can get. and the team seems willing to play that out because here's the problem the mets are saying, yeah, right, freddie freeman and matt olson are at one hundred and sixty five hundred and seventy million dollars Alonzo and Boris are saying he is to the Mets what Aaron Judge is to the Yankees. That's $360 million. That's a big gap in between the two of them. I personally would trade him and then let him go to free agency, try to sign him as a free agent with whatever the market says, and, and get the prospects. I don't think the Mets are going to really compete in that division this year, so I would trade him. I don't think they will. I think they'll play it out, let him go to free agency, but I do expect him to be a Met in 2025. All right, Steve Phillips, we appreciate you taking the time, getting us ready as we approach spring training. It's going to be here before you know it. Appreciate it. We're in my Honolulu blue for the Lions. Let's hey, go. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Let's see it. Uh, speaking of summer and, and palm trees and all of that, it's summer down under at, at the Australian Open in Coco Golf. Unfortunately, her time is done in Melbourne. No. But we'll discuss all that's happening in Australia on the other side. Welcome back to the rally. Brooke Fletcher here alongside Danny Kay, and you are one of the hosts on the tennis channel. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have to talk about the Scott Australian about Open. It. And last night, man, it was one of the most highly anticipated matches <laughs> of know. the tournament so far mm -hmm. as we approach the finals here. We have Arena Sabalenka taking on Coco Golf. And as much as we would love that the U.S. Uh, player won, Sabalenka, she had her revenge and she got the best of her. What did you make of the match as a whole? Yeah, you know, and Coco Golf really had opportunities there to steal it from Sabalenka. It really came down to just a couple points here and there. She definitely had her chances in the first set. She saved a set point, charged back from a 5-2 deficit, uh, came within two points of winning that first set. But it was just really difficult to see for Coco Golf. Look, she has been playing absolutely unbelievable tennis, undefeated so far this year. She's won 12 straight Grand Slam matches coming into this one. So her confidence should have been sky high, but I think her performance the round before this meetup with Sabalenka kind of got into her nerves a little bit because she really didn't play well against Marta Kostyuk, but great 
great thoughts moving forward for yeah. the American because I do believe she will continue to go deep and deep in these tournaments. But Arena Sabalenka was just out for blood. And it's something about playing in Australia for Sabalenka because she extended her winning streak to 13 it's matches filed. there in Melbourne. So I feel like, though, we saw it in the U.S. Open, the finals there, these two. And then, you know, Sabalenka, she kind of talked about it after the match and how much she enjoys playing Coco Golf. So is this one of the next best rivalries that we're maybe going to see in tennis? 100%. Because Coco Golf, you have to remember, she's still so young. Yeah. And she is just climbing towards these bigger goals. And Sabalenka has been firmly in the one and two spot in the world for quite some time now. So Sabalenka is always going to be deeper in those tournaments. She just continues to make semifinal after semifinal. So we're going to continue to see that matchup between her and Coco Goff. I think what's exciting for the Americans is to see an American tennis player solidify herself at the top of those tournaments on a consistent basis. So I think because she's up there, Sabalenka is usually always going to be there as well. We're going to start to see some amazing rivalries and some great matches, which is very exciting. And Sabalenka, she's going to move on to the final. She's the first woman to have back-to-back -back finals appearances since Serena Williams, mm -hmm. one of the greatest to ever play the game. All right, let's get to the men's because we have a great match on deck here. How about Novak Djokovic uh, in the semifinals? He is taking on Yannick Sinner. Now, this is interesting because Yannick has actually gotten the best of uh, Novak before, so can he do it again here tonight? Absolutely. I mean, Yannick Sinner has looked nearly flawless this entire tournament. He has yet to drop a set. And the last time that these two played each other, Yannick Sinner walked away with a victory. Now, the difference is Novak Djokovic is unbelievable as a tennis player, period, but he's even more unbelievable at the Australian Open. He's won it 10 freaking times. He's going for his 11th title in Australia. But Yannick Sinner has the tools and has just continued to get better and better. And he's just been playing lights out tennis. So I think that this one is one that everybody had circled, hoping that we were going to get treated to it. And I actually think whoever wins this one goes on and wins the whole thing. All right. Well, let's uh, real quick that we have Medvedev taking on Sasha Zverev. Real quick, who do you think is going in that one? Well, this is the 19th meeting. You want to talk about a rivalry? This is a rivalry. It's going to get heated. There's going to be mind games being played left and right. If I had to give an edge to somebody, I just think Zverev can do it because Medvedev has won the last couple. Uh, but I think that Zverev actually has the confidence right now because he upset Carlos Alcaraz. Everyone thought Carlos Alcaraz would make it to the final. Didn't happen. So oh. Zverev, I think he's got it. I love all the rivalries I know, in it tennis. So right? I right. love that Brooke loves some tennis. JP, we need to get you on board here. <laughs> Oh, there oh, you go. Some, some All right. Well, you got the swing yeah, down. Yeah. Now we just got to get you in front of a TV. I'm Maybe. an athlete. <laughs> what are you doing at 2.30 a.m.? You didn't want to watch the match? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> no, I was actually having a really nice slumber. I was, I was bragging about it yesterday. Nice and I was like, slumber. I'm going to get up early. She's like, yeah, no, I'm going to watch. I was trying to dream of a Coco Golf win. It right? just didn't happen. <laughs> I, I watched the highlights this morning. That was the best I could do. All right. Listen, there was some major shift in both the college and pro football landscape yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we are talking about Jim Harbaugh. He left Michigan to go to the L.A. Chargers as their new head coach. And now that the dust is starting to settle, JP, it's time to look ahead. So let's start from the Wolverine side here. A to-do list for them as we head uh, into this next season. Yes, I've got a to-do list. I think there are really four items that should be top of mind for the University of Michigan as they enter their new era. Starting with number one, you have to retain Ben Herbert. He is their strength and conditioning coach. He is one of the biggest pillars of culture in Michigan football. And I understand why all of the players love him. I understand why he was able to develop so many bodies. I've met him numerous times. I've talked to him. He is one of the most genuine people in the business. He just gets it. He's able to connect. And so I think if they can have him around, they can create some continuity in terms of the way they develop players because we know Michigan isn't up there in the top five, top ten year in and year out in recruiting, but also the culture that allowed Michigan to get over the top these last three seasons. The second thing, you have to solidify the defensive coordinator. Now, I'm going off of the assumption that Sharon Moore is going to be elevated from offensive coordinator, offensive line coach, up to the head coach. The rumors are that Jim Harbaugh would like to take Jesse Minter with him to L.A. Jesse Minter is a guy who came from that Ravens defensive system. Everybody's trying to get a piece of it. He was the architect of one of the best defenses we have seen in college football in a very long time. You have to make sure that you can get a coordinator in there who is that good schematically, who is that good of a developmental guy, who is that good of a teacher, and somebody that the players can really buy into. I think they have to hit on that because they've got the continuity on the offensive side, considering Sharon Moore will probably get that job. Third thing, re-recruit the roster. And I think this is going to be a little bit of a bigger deal on defense, as I talked about yeah. with the new coach over there, not to mention Jay Harbaugh, who was coaching in the secondary as well as special teams, not being around on the defensive side. Going to have to be some buy-in that's generated. Where they have an advantage here is if they do go internal, 
a lot of guys are going to feel really good about the hire. We saw the way that the players spoke about Sharon Moore when he had to step in as the interim coach throughout the season. He has that locker room. He has the ear of the players. That's really important. And then the last one, the final one, and probably the most important one on here, you have to develop and maintain the plan to beat Ohio State. They've done it three years in a row now. You're going to be entering a new era without the head coach that you had once upon a time. Things in that program are going to change naturally, but the one thing that does not change is you have to beat your biggest rival. That is the Ohio State Buckeyes. So Sharon Moore has been around. He understands what it means. He was on the sideline as the head coach. He knows coach what it feels like. This past November, with the victory over Ohio State, he has to maintain the momentum they have in that rivalry. I like what you said about Ben Herbert, because one thing I remember talking to Jesse Mentor when we covered Michigan earlier uh, in the season last year was he, I mean, I asked him, I was like, thoughts on Ben Herbert? He talked for like five minutes about this yep. guy, just the impact that he's had. Chris Jenkins, a lot of those a lot of those players in the development and the strides that they have made over the last few seasons, it's because of that guy. So you mentioned that's a priority. Yes, they need to keep him. But I mean, what do you think is going to be, You obviously these are the two do list but what do you think is going to be the most difficult for the Wolverines to achieve on this list uh, I think it's going to be twofold here is number one I've talked a little bit about culture and that's not one of the things I directly put on here I think that maintaining continuity and culture is important I think for Sharon Moore whoever gets that job you got to put your own little imprint on the program and some guys may have a little bit of a difficult time adjusting to that I think they might be a little bit of a difficult time adjusting to seeing their coach in a different space the other one, which I hope is a struggle for them, is the Ohio State one because as well as Michigan has done these last few years, Ohio State has gone all in this year, not only to beat Michigan, but all in, it seems like, for a championship and what they did retaining players and also getting players out of the portal. For Sharon Moore, who has had success in this rivalry already, you would like to follow that up with another good performance against the Buckeyes. I think you're talking about the chemistry and the re-recruiting. They kind of tie into one another yep. because you have yeah. to feel like this coaching staff, this new one, wants me. Yep. Yeah. And then you buy in. No, I mean, there's a lot of things for them to consider um, as they head into next season. But from one of the best teams in college football to one of the worst teams in the NFL, <laughs> the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, they just found their new head coach in Dave Canales. So will things change with him at the helm? Well, we're going to discuss on the other side of the break.
Welcome back to the rally, everybody. Brooke Fletcher, Joshua Perry, and Danny Kay. Guys, let's talk more coaching here because the Panthers, they have hired a new head coach and Bucks offensive coordinator in uh, Dave Canales. So have you seen anything from him, JP, that indicates he is going to be the right guy for that job in working with Bryce Young? I mean, he worked with Baker Mayfield. And Baker had a <laughs> yeah. bit of a renaissance, so sure I feel did. like that is a good indication there. Uh, you're talking about Baker Mayfield, a guy who was the top overall pick in his draft class, and uh, he had some, some bright moments early on in his career, certainly, but really started to fizzle out. And now we're talking about Baker as a guy who we feel could take the reins of a franchise, should be a guy who could be uh, a good option here for the next few years. Didn't know how many people thought he was going to get there at the beginning of the year. I certainly didn't. I was totally out on the Baker Mayfield experiment. Now you go to Bryce Young, who's a top pick in his draft class, and did not have a good start to his career. And part of the reason why was, I think, the way that the offense was designed structured the other part of the reason why is not a lot around him they're gonna have to fix that offensive line so he can stay upright but mm -hmm. ultimately if you have somebody who you're confident in that can design plays that can develop quarterbacks then you feel like this is a guy that should be around Bryce Young last thing I'll say here is all of that may be true he might be the right guy to work with the quarterback down there in Carolina the coordinator who's hot does not always translate into the head coach that is great so he's going to have to make sure he's got a staff around him that he really trusts and some mentors that can really lean in to him being a head coach. Well, the GM, Dan Morgan, actually used to work with him in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Seattle is that's a Pete Carroll run system who a lot of people really love the way Pete Carroll runs his regime over there. So he's been he spent so much time with Pete Carroll and that staff. He was with him at USC. Mm -hmm. was the strength and conditioning coach. He's been the passing game coordinator, wide, coordinator, wide receivers coach, quarterbacks coach. So he has you know, dealt with different pieces of the puzzle there, especially offensively. But you talked about Baker Mayfield, but another a couple quarterbacks that he worked with, Russell Wilson, sure. who set a career high with 40 touchdowns and 68.8 completion percentage for over 4,200 yards when he worked with him. Uh, you also saw Geno Smith with a career high number of yards as well. And just because he's worked, seen a lot of different quarterbacks come to fruition underneath his tutelage. I think that's a really good sign. Yeah, and he has had a lot of success working working with quarterbacks. You know, you mentioned Baker Mayfield. We talk about Geno Smith, and he's a disciple of Pete Carroll there. But I will say, not hi hiring somebody that doesn't have head coaching experience, there's a lot of pressure yeah. on him. And David Tepper especially, because this is their third diff this is their third coach in three years. So. You have to get this higher right. It's it, may, it raises the question, should they have gone with somebody with experience? So what are your thoughts on that? Could they have gotten the guy with the experience that they really wanted? Like, if I'm sitting there and I am a, a head coach who has coached and had success in the NFL, and I look at Frank Reich, who came in, they hired him, then Frank Reich was like, C.J. Stroud is the guy that I want to get. And Tepper's like, no, you're going to get Bryce Young, and you're going to like it. And he's like, okay. Then my man goes 1-10, you're one as the coach of the Panthers, and Tepper's like, get out of here. You're done. If I am a veteran head coach, I'm looking at that and I'm saying, this is so dysfunctional. I do not want to put my career in that man's hands. Now, with a younger head coach, you're going to get a guy who's a little bit more eager, a little bit more willing, and probably somebody who is happier to work with, maybe an overbearing owner versus a head coach who's kind of stuck in his ways it, yeah. and entrenched in the type of system he wants to be in. So felt like this might have been the right option because they might not have been able to pursue the veteran guy they wanted. Yeah, well, the Panthers, they went 2-14 and 14 in young 16 starts last season, so we'll see uh, what he can do with that young quarterback there and the Panthers in Charlotte. All right, well, let's uh, get to big picture in the NFL because they announced their finalists to all of their awards mm -hmm. from this past season. So let's take a look at the MVP nominees, shall we? We have at the top... We have Josh Allen. Oh, boy. That was a surprise, at least for me. Lamar Jackson, who is, in my opinion, the favorite. Christian McCaffrey, Dak Prescott, Brock Purdy. What do you think this comes down to, JP? Or no, I just, yeah, I just wanted to him. give a little defense here to Josh Allen because go. I don't think he's going to win it. But I will tell you, he put to arguably one of his best seasons of his career together because he had an unlikely late season turnaround, right? They won a playoff win. Uh, they got the division title. That That's pretty shocking based off of the uh, – state that Buffalo was in at one point in time. So that's all I'm saying about Josh Allen, but I don't believe he wins it. It's LJ's picks. That's I he that's puts what, ball I, on the ground too. I just don't when you think of an MVP, I in my opinion, I think Tyreek Hill should be in it over Josh Allen. I mean, that's talking about of, difference makers on the team. 
not to discredit what Josh Allen did yes. down the final stretch of the season because he was finally playing like we knew Josh Allen should be playing at. But like you, I think as an MVP, you have to be consistent all season long, and he was not that. I'm, I'm with you from the standpoint of there was probably another player at a different position, and Tyreek would have been uh, a good answer for that, that you could have put in instead of trying to figure out, okay, is there another quarterback that we felt like you know, should should be a part of this award. And Danny, I'm not arguing the way that he finished the season because it was a great turnaround for him. And the way that he played definitely correlated to team success. But I also look at the way that, that he plays ball a lot of times. It's like, he gives you the MVP moments, but it's the same thing that also ends up hurting him a lot of times. So mm -hmm. should there be two Niners on the list? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, I because so. you, I mean, Who people are going to make the argument. People, so, Chris, I, think I, I, Christian I think McCaffrey. It's, I think it's CMC, but I also, I also think what Brock Purdy did was, by the way we judge quarterbacks, MVP worthy. Who's a better quarterback, Jared Goff or Brock Purdy? Uh, oh, boy. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. I, I if think, you have I to mull that over. Brock Purdy plays better. Jared Goff, I think, is actually a more talented player, if that makes sense. Saying, because like, and, MVP. No, I'm, and I'm does totally he play better because of the pieces that are around it's, him? It's because you have Christian McCaffrey on your team because you have a Debo system. Samuel. But I also think that what they've done in Detroit with the offensive design, the system, the way that they're able to run the football, the way that they have developed players, which people don't like to do in the NFL, I think has really helped Jared Goff. Yeah. So I, I, there's a lot of back and forth thing that you can do here. I just think the numbers that Brock Purdy put up, it would be really hard to say he was not on an MVP tear. LJ That's wins fair. this. Oh, 100%. I, I think he's there's the guy. It's his Duluth. I, it's his Duluth. I think yeah. he's the guy. Yeah. But CMC, I also got to give a lot of credit to. And I, I just don't know when the running back's ever going to win the award again. But, like. If someone should, it absolutely should be him. He dictates so much. He's got so the triple crown, right? Leader touches, touchdowns, yards. Yes. He's unbelievable. And, and he's like, I mean, you saw him on the sideline. His, his thigh is all banged up. He's hurt. And he's still out there he's just it all out there for you. Let's talk about the Coach of the Year finalists, shall we? Dan Me Campbell, be obviously, yeah. on that list. John Arbaugh, D'Amico Ryan, Kyle Shanahan, Kevin Stefanski. You said you two are going to be arguing, yeah. huh? Uh, well, I'll let Brooke have the floor first then. I've been making the case that it should be Dan Campbell. I know you have. And Detroit I know, bias. look at what D'Amico Ryans did, you know. Why did you he, say that like I, you were rolling your eyes that, as I you said it? Because, because I know where it's coming. Because I know, oh, it. oh, coming. Yeah. Because I know what you're, you're you going to come go. at me at, with. <laughs> yes, you want it to be, D'Amico Ryans, you can't take away from what he did with the Texans. You look at C.J. Stroud and the fact that nobody expected them to play, to get where they went this season. You have to give him credit. But I'm, when you look at the Lions and Dan Campbell and what he has been able to do for this team, it is, you can't even compare. He changed the entire culture. He took a dead organization and brought it to life. They could potentially win a Super Bowl. And I know you have to base it off of regular season, whatever. But Dan Campbell is clearly the front runner in what he was able to do with these rookies. You have Sam Laporta, you have Jameer Gibbs, you have uh, Brian Branch. I mean, in that, that he shouldn't take all that credit. He shouldn't take all the credit. But what he was able to do with those pieces that he had and turn it into a Super Bowl contender, that has to count for something, and that's why he should be coach of the year. Listen, Where's Mike Apple? I, I, I think that you have made a lot of really valid points. I also think that part of the coach of the year is expectations for what the organization was going to do in that Nobody, specific year. Yeah, I'll leave People thought that Detroit could win their division coming into the season. That was not something that would have shocked a ton of people. I think a lot of people would, would have questioned what they would do in the postseason because same old Lions. But we looked at that team and we looked at the rest of the division and we said question mark in Green Bay. Chicago can't get anything right. And Kirk Cousins, God love them, empty calories. We don't even know if that's going to be a real team. They might have some issues on defense. And we looked at the Lions and said that they had built a culture and that they had gotten the roster right that they drafted well and we felt like they could win the division we look at the Texans who by the way are another dead organization have not had very much success outside of what Bill O'Brien did for them uh, and we're like okay rookie quarterback not a lot of talent on that roster probably going to finish in the basement of the division we felt like Indianapolis could be another one of those teams that might be there because of what their quarterback situation was going to be coming into the year but we did not have very high hopes for them now you get to a point where they did win their division they did make it to the playoffs and oh by the way their quarterback and, and uh, their edge rusher that they drafted this year two rookies 
up for Offensive Rookie, Defensive Rookie of the and Year. And he's done a hell of a job. He is some of the top picks in the draft there, but the way that the Lions have been drafting, and I know it's like you can't, whatever. They, the way that they have been drafting and what Dan Campbell has done, it's hard to argue against that. Well, I just think Brooke Brinks makes a great point because you are talking about that it was a whole bunch of new pieces there. But coming into the season, who was more excited about their quarterback? C.J. Stroud and the Texans or Jerry Goff But he's a rookie. Lions? But who was more excited about it? Let's be honest. There's the, expectations when you had some of the top picks the draft. You were excited about the quarterback, but you had no expectation for the team with the Texans. People might not be excited about Jared Goff, but they're like, damn, this could be a solid team. Like, this could be the I year where they actually want to play off. I game. think it's subjective. I think when you have some of the top picks in the draft, there are certain expectations. Like, you were not, supposed to be a difference maker. I think there's supposed to be difference makers, no doubt. The Lions drafted two guys in the first round of the draft, too. So let's not act like yeah, they didn't nobody, get two difference but makers But nobody as thought well. Jameer Gibbs was going to be I I told you he was... I'm just saying. I told you he was going to You know be. what? All right, we got to move on. We got to move on. Speaking of the fact that the Lions are very exciting, and they're yes. a hot ticket in town, bro. Yes, Ticket IQ is projecting that the average price for the game in San Francisco Sunday to be around. I told you it was going to get like that. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the price is supposed to expect to be around two and a half. Wait, two. What is it? Over two thousand. Thank you. To over two thousand dollars. Sorry, I can't read. Uh, what does this tell you? <laughs> Should have put the number there. It, does. it says two and a half. It, 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 yeah, it, does. it doesn't make sense. They type it. Either. It's fine. Um, well, what it, what it tells you, script. what it tells you <laughs> is that Lions fans are not taking any of this stuff for granted because I'm sure they're going to be out there. Uh, and also, I think Niners fans are really excited too. Like this is, I think, a game that people are genuinely excited to be able to see. They're two really good teams. They're two teams with very unique stories. Like, let's go. Let's yeah. play a fun game with this, shall we? We should. Well, I think we just get in. Danny, you, you're familiar with the show Prices, right? Yes, right? I am. Okay, so I worked on it. It gave us an idea here um, where we're going to talk about Come some prices. Okay, let's play a little over under game, all right? Uh, and we got these prices on StubHub, so just to give you some idea where we came up with these numbers. So you have to tell me if the actual price is over or under the price that I give you. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. NBA All Star game, over under $950. Over. I'm going to say over as well. That is correct. $1,094. Yeah. Yes. NHL skills competition, over under 200. Mm. Do, do, under. Do, do, I'm going do, do. with over. It's in Canada. You say over, you say under? It's under. It's $90. <sighs> wow. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm doing well. All right. Waste management in Phoenix. Um. <laughs> Is I it? actually. Oh, and we, it's important to know it's the open. It's on Saturday, one of the most popular days there. Over, under. 1,000% over. I'm, I'm hitting the over on that one as well. Shockingly, it's under. Wow. No. It's 63 Not when the Super Bowl was there. I, wow. know, I tried. Wow. We got to double check on that. And I was oh, too broke. No. All right. NCAA men's basketball championship wrong. game. Over, under $200. I feel like right I now it's, it's under because nobody knows who's going to be there. You said over? Over. It's under. $185. Are we tied now? Hate this for us. Yeah. I don't. I wasn't keeping up, but that was fun. Yeah. Fun little game there. Oh, that's it. We got one. Oh, we got one we more. Got okay. Tiebreaker. Okay, one more. One more. Notre Dame spring game over under. Don't look. Ten dollars. Under. I was gonna say under too, so I have to do the opposite. He answered first. I'll say over. It's over. It's fifty dollars. <laughs> Yay! I, win. I get to spin it and try to get to a dollar and then go to the final round. I can't wait. This is very exciting. Thank All you, guys. right, uh, coming up, we got, we're going to talk the Wizards, and they may have just fired their head coach, but it's fine because they're giving away Jordan Poole pull towels tonight. Wow, that's exciting. Can we come up with a better fan giveaway? You be the judge on the other side of the break. Stick around.
Guys, in the wizard, the Wizards, they may be feeling down after firing Wes Unsell, but cheer up, everybody, because Jordan Poole, they're giving away some pool towels. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, celebrating their guy. Uh, they're going to be giving those out tonight. So would you lay out in the sun with this one, Danny? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Why not? I mean, who doesn't need a new towel? And you know what? I kind of like to play on a pool party. Right? I think it's fun. I think that if people are hating on it like this guy's about to do. Just don't have a sense of humor. I'm not going to hate on it, but I am going to hate on something you said. You should ask my wife if we need more towels, because one thing I have been known <laughs> to do is steal towels when I'm on business trips and bring them back home from the hotel. Oh, all That's, right. Well, someone arrest him since he just committed a crime. You, what, what else do you? No, we don't have time to get into what else you take from no. hotels. That's a We have to do that another day. It's a social media series. Yeah, no, it really <laughs> is. All right, well, uh, it got us thinking, like, if we were with other teams, what would we give away celebrating uh, either players or coaches? So let's start with the Chargers here. And maybe we're going to give away some khakis in honor of their new head coach, Jim Harbaugh. Oh, wow. Yeah. What what loves to wear him some khakis. Yeah. What do AI you think? Chargers can not spell correctly at the top. They should give out khakis. Why wouldn't they? I think that's a great idea. Now, it will be, you know. What is going a, on here? It's a bit of a concern because you don't know people's <laughs> sizes, but I think it's great. To honor Why is my man the only one, like, wearing his and everybody else got him, like, plastered across say, the back? I mean, it's like they're expecting a flood. Why are they, like, up so high? All right, let's get to the Florida Gators here. Uh, free jean shorts. We know the Gators love some jorts. Some jorts. This was definitely oh, the work of Michael T. Morris, oh, who yes. is a Florida State alum and fan and he hates on Gators and honestly says they were this jorts. is so on brand for, for the Gators here like yeah. I this is actually a great idea yeah they should do this absolutely because it's so it's hot nice there point. you can't be caught dead in a regular pair of jeans yeah it's just you know the way of life down there put on some old jorts <laughs> should I wear jorts no, no. Hmm. I don't think you should <laughs> all right let's get to Michigan here you don't have a coach but you have flavor Flav how about some clock chains Flavor, flavor. Does he usually put an alarm clock around his neck, or is it just like a regular why wall he clock? A, why has he got a mask on? What's, like, what's what is going on here? The Still COVID. There. Oh, it's apparently. <laughs> Back to the COVID <laughs> I think that's time. a cool idea. Flavor, Flav, how many Michigan games do you think you went to this year? I don't know. Not the point. Falcons, uh, your team isn't good, but there's still some free grits. To get fans in the stadium. Is that's his fantastic. tongue covered in grits? Ew, that's nasty. Uh -huh. Why, are, why, why is their tongue grit? I, I don't like any of this. This is making me Look, really uncomfortable. This guy is all of us right now. Look at Ooh. it! <laughs> I am really, really uncomfortable. I mean, I do love some good old grits. I do you got too. Bit some cheese grits. Yeah. You might have Definitely me there. Definitely no sugar in the grits. What is it oh, like, no. blended rice? I have never had it. It's a it's a I'm grain of South. sorts. Yeah, but the Waffle House one, you just lay like a piece of cheese on it. And just it's, a, mm, a it's slap so good. Of, Interesting. Slice right. of America. And we can't forget about Bill's Mafia here. Uh, they're down in the dumps <laughs> right now. Cheer up with some free tables to jump through. All right. <laughs> I love it. They Supplying would just throw them. them on the field yeah. and at people. Yes, they throw plenty of things on the field. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Either that or ladders. But I, it's probably easier to carry around some like small fold uh, folded up like tables. You I, know? I hate how AI cannot spell. Like it's supposed to be artificial oh, intelligence. Buffalo. Buffalo. And do it's you see that? just it's not that intelligent. Do you see it? All right, I well, do. Bills, it bothers Mike. me so much. Buffalo. Bills. No, not it's Buffalo very Bill. infuriating. The Get it right. Figure it out, AI. Buffalo. Figure it out. <laughs> All right. Well, the Bills are not heading to the Super Bowl, That's so fantastic. but you know who is. Tiesto, oh. you know the DJ? He's oh. going to be the DJ right. at the Super Bowl. I don't know the, DJ. Uh, the first ever one, I think, the first in game. So, what do what do you think? Do we I really love need this? Do Probably not, it? but who doesn't love to enhance the game? Yeah, we don't give a damn. Like people watching on TV, we don't care. Folks in the stadium Absolutely certainly would care. appreciate it. I get a little party. A lot there. of people are, are investing in the in stadium experience, and I think it's the right thing to do as much as they want to charge for tickets. Yeah, I was gonna say, how much money are those tickets? It's definitely over. Like go back to the last <laughs> game. Over, over. It's over. You think this is gonna be the new thing of like, you know, you have the the halftime performer is like very like the job to get. What about the in-game DJ? I bet you the DJs are all clamoring for the job. I'm sure. That'd be fun. It's Form probably the Super Bowl. All right, I think we have time for a quick trip across the Rallyverse here. We got the Sixers, they're taking on the Pacers. Who'd be better person to help you move apartments? Larry Bird or good old Charles Barkley? Chuck. Chuck 
and I'm not exactly sure how helpful he's going to be, but we're going to have a hell of a time. See, I feel like he'd be more helpful than Larry I think Charles, yeah. because you need some entertainment, because moving day is really stressful. Yeah. And Charles will make light of the situation, yeah. if you, as well as help you move some boxes. He may complain just as much as I do. But, yeah. but if you get that man a dozen Krispy Kremes, he is good to go. Yeah. All right, Joel Embiid is averaging 40 in January. Does he top 40 points tonight? Yes. Pacers, not known for the defense. All Absolutely. right, last one here. Let's get to the Celtics. They're taking on the Heat. Where would Miami be on a list of best cities in America for you, Joshua? I haven't spent a lot of time there. I have. I don't like it in Miami. All right. It's really? hot. I like the boats and all that, but it's sticky. Mm. Your hair goes like, your makeup can never stay Isn't on. Isn't it expensive You kind of look like a wet, a wet dog at all times. I do love the Costa. beach. I like the warm weather. I like the beach. That part's good. So it'll go somewhere in the middle. But it's really not like my, the out of all the options of the, like the warm weather cities, it's not my favorite. Sorry. All right. Well, thankfully, we live in Chicago where you don't have to worry about humanity. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a bad day. Let me go walk tomorrow. in the rain. Bye, guys. <laughs>